I'm so glad to have Prophet Ed with us here. How many of you were able to make it last night? It was a blessing. I mean, Friday night, I should say. How about last Friday night? <laughs> and a good word that he shared with us. We have known Ed and his wife, Louisa. She'll be with us in the second service today. And um, we, we've known them for quite a while now and enjoy just having time together and being long-term relationships with people in ministry. Uh, as I was coming in this morning, the Lord spoke to me and said, you know, faith doesn't get old. Amen. When you get older, faith doesn't get less. If you've been exercising your faith, your faith is the strongest in your older years. And think about it, how God used Abraham. He wasn't a young fella. I say 99 years old is kind of old to get your wife pregnant who's already been through menopause. And then Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob. These are all older, on in their years. Sometimes we just got to get old enough to have had enough of ourselves and want more of God. So don't disqualify yourself if you're getting older that God can't use you. He'll use you with the younger people to help them to grow in their faith as well. Hallelujah. Father, we pray your blessing over this offering. Yes. We release our faith in the mighty name of Jesus. And we pray your blessing upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's welcome Ed Trout as he comes. All right. Thank you. We'll move it down here. I like to get close to the family of God. Since from the day you're born to the day we leave this planet, we're all on a journey. Every person is on a journey. That looks more natural now where you're sitting. I couldn't figure out when I saw you last, when I saw you before in Africa, it didn't fit. Remember that? I saw uh, this little lady in, in Africa when I was ministering, and just something, just my brain went into a whiz. It's like, that face doesn't belong in this setting here. It's very unusual. So anyway, in Africa. So for those who don't know, my name is Ed Trout. I'm husband of one wife who will be a little later. We're 47 years married. I have three children and 10 grandchildren. If I'd known what fun grandkids were, I would have skipped having children completely. Just <laughs> gone straight for the grandkids. Although now all I've become is an ATM. <laughs> all right. So your life is on a journey. Every one of you, no matter where you are, and it's, um, it's so sad to me that we, we start out with all this energy and zeal and so stupid. And then when we get a little bit of wisdom, we're old and too tired to use it correctly. And we just, it seems like you go your whole life through to gain wisdom just so you can die with it. So it must be that God is more f interested in the journey than the actual arrival. The actual dealing with every situation in our lives. And God is very inserted in our lives, very inserted. He's very involved where you are. He's not doing everything you think he should be because he's got a much bigger visual of where you're going, where you come from, and you have to trust him. If you knew all that God knew, you wouldn't need to trust him. It's because you don't know and you've given your life to him, let him be in control, even though it doesn't make sense. It's not possible to, for your own children, you, when they're little, you tell them, they ask you why, you say, because I say so. And they say, we say that, we use that phrase because we have no time or ability to explain to a child why we're telling them. When they get older, we start to unfold and explain things as they get understanding. But as we walk with the Lord until we have a complete devotion to him, God just wants us to do what he says and learn to trust him and not always try to figure these things out. Your life will be a lot safer and better and more effective. Life throws curveballs and all kinds of challenges to every person, whether you're a Christian or non-Christian. Life happens to everybody. The rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous. Jesus told you to build your house on a, on a rock because a storm was coming. Whether you built your house in the sand and rock, both would get the same storm. One would survive and one wouldn't. So when you have something more substantial in your own walk with God, whatever life throws at you, you're able to deal with it and get through it a lot easier and better. But this one thing you must know today, how vitally important you are individually to God. God made you and created you very differently. And that's why you are on this planet. They went berserk in my town in San Antonio with uh, the eclipse. And some preachers spoke, spoke a lot of nonsense. But nevertheless, they all panicked and it was the end of the world and Lord knows what else. And 
Uh, but the, but the, the, they marvel at these things. But we stuck on a planet. God had himself had made billions of angelic beings, billions and billions, and they would function. And they are supernatural. They can take on different forms. They have no time. They have no age. They, they're immortal. And these beings he made like that. But in his effort to have a relationship, he, he lifted one up and empowered him more with great ability to choose. And he chose to leave God and take one third of the entire host of angels. And God has said that a lake of fire awaits for those, the one third is waiting for them. And all they did was one thing wrong was they rebelled against God. And it seems like there was no plan or idea or even desire to redeem any of these immortal beings. Then God changes gears and begins to create something very different for the very first time. Looking for the relationship, God takes his own very own DNA, which he's not done before. And he makes man in his image. But not wanting to subject them to the same angelic, immortal, timeless, move through space and all kinds of things. God limited it to a very mortal house, takes up one planet. And from that planet, he creates a house for that spirit that's made in his image. So that there is a limit, there is a boundary. And God didn't want us to be uninformed. And in this garden, the symbol of, in the garden of knowledge of good and evil and the garden and, and the tree of, of life, it was our choice. But the knowledge of good and evil didn't have any more information than we really needed. The information that the first thing that they awakened to was their nakedness and didn't help anything. And so God in his kindness was trying to keep information from, from us that we choose to love him and not let this pollute the journey we were on to learn to know him and choose him. He wants us to want him, not because they, we have to, but because we want, because we choose it. And so the unfolded salvation plan began down the ages with mankind. And here you are today, you are one of those descendants and you have a very much an immortal spirit living in a very mortal body. And you have your own soul, your own will, your own, your own mind to make your own decisions. And so <clears throat> you wonder why God doesn't just appear and show himself to you. That way everybody would believe. But they wouldn't. Because even when he did, they still didn't believe. Yeah. So there's a big choice and a journey involved in wanting and knowing God. Because in every human being, the seed of God is planted according to Romans. Every human being. There is no such thing as an agnostic. Everyone, even the, the worst atheist, when he cusses, he cusses at God, not at any other, any other being. And he, he, and he always challenged God. If you're real, then do this. Show yourself. They'll always challenge him and hate him, not anything else. If they don't believe in him, why do they even have that demeanor? And so I'm trying to explain to you where you are in your life journey so looking at your own individual journey you've had all kinds of stuff to deal with and life is escalating at such a rapid pace that that uh, we didn't have the emotional wars to deal with that we have to do now and things move so fast and everybody's life is nothing new under the sun so all the problems you're dealing with have always been there it just seem to be far more intense and far much faster than they are now but at the same time where sin abounded did grace abound even more freely and God in his great grace is watching over your life so you're sitting here this morning and you somehow you think you landed here you may be coming here for years you may be here for the first time but either way the Holy Ghost the Almighty God himself orchestrated your being here today you are very important to God and I do not want you leaving here not realizing that if there was nobody else on this planet but you he still would have sacrificed his only son he would have still had the same dedication to you that he has today God does care there's nobody that cares for you like God that's the truth when I was 13 I gave my heart to Jesus I am from a Jewish family my family exiled the Holocaust my mother was born in Germany in Berlin we are from a whole family from Berlin and uh, they exiled on a refugee ship that took them to Cape Town South Africa where I was born I wasn't raised Orthodox, I was raised Jewish, but not Orthodox, and the family was very broken. They divorced when I was very young, and we were thrown backwards and forwards, and a very rough childhood, very rough. And <clears throat> when I was 10, I heard the gospel for the first time. A little lady came to our school and took an assembly at an arranged pastor, had arranged to get him in, this woman into the school. She was a child evangelist from England. Her name was Auntie Sunny, they called her, and she had a big flannel board. When, we're talking about the early 60s, so you can imagine there was no such thing as phones or TV. 
TVs in, in Africa especially. And so her big entertaining lit up flannel board she would take off layer by layer telling a story that I remember in detail to this day. In detail, and the story she told, she would, um, God knowing my little Jewish nature, I suppose, where she would ask questions after the story she tells, and she would reward them with a book, with candy, with even with coins, with money. And I had my hand up, and she picked me, thank God, and then she gave me a money. And I was so interested in this God that can give me money <laughs> and love me, so I wanted to know more. So the little 10-year-old boy followed her to the nearest school break where she had her, her uh, campaign or reaching out to the kids and I won more prizes and I was really roped into this whole thing. And to Sunday school I went and uh, she had me there for three years or they had me there for three years and finally said, why don't you come to church? And I did and there they preached the hell out of me. <laughs> and I got saved for five Sundays in a row. But when I got saved, when I got born again, it wasn't because I was saved from sin. I was 13. What do I know about sin? I didn't know what sin was. And so I got saved because I met someone. It was for me personally, not just some strange commitment because I heard the gospel. It was an actual experience. I met him and it was so nostalgic for me that I kept doing it until they told me, you don't have to keep doing this. You don't have to keep coming forward and being prayed over. But I loved it so much. The sensation was, for, I couldn't wait for the next time I could do it again because it was so real. And he became so real to me and in my life's journey I've enjoyed him I didn't wasn't saved from sin I did all my sin after I was born again and spirit filled and still God forgave me he still he forgives me continually he's full of grace and full of mercy so that's a, he'll never stop he'll never stop let no one judge you or don't you judge anybody else because God himself walks with each one his love for us is in unbelievably and I say unbelievable your mind can conceive it intense he loves us so much, the older I become, the one thing that I keep getting more understanding and revelation is how great his love is. It's just incredible. It's beyond anything you've ever tasted, known, or imagined. His love is unfailing. It's, it's completely consistent, not dependent on how good you are. He loves you just because you are his. The devil knows that and he hates everything about that because he could never have that love or the redemption. So he's doing all he can to keep you from God. He deliberately, from the day you're born, fights to keep you from God. And every time you start approaching God or becoming in any way attached to him or even valuable to God, he'll do whatever he can because he studies your life. He's got so many agents of his own to send you and to use in your life. And so it's a real war going on around and it's a, it's a losing battle for him, but we must cling to him and have more knowledge and understanding. In my personal journey, I was a pastor. I went to Bible school, went to become a pastor. It was unstoppable. I was a teenager that couldn't shut my mouth about this wonderful message I'd heard. And so in my school, in my high school years, we had a revival in the school itself. Uh, it was quite, uh, it was phenomenal. It was put into magazines and it was in, in a very, lot of news about it. And the whole hostel I was in, I was in a hostel with other boys. The whole hostel got saved and teachers got saved. It was really quite something. And my headmaster didn't, or the principal didn't care for it. But years later, I baptized that very same principal in my own swimming pool in Africa. So the Lord had really worked in his life and it was a, and I had a kept relationship with him until his passing. But it was very, very interesting um, all the years that have gone gone by and what God has done um, uh, not without mistakes and failures that I've made and I've learned to know that uh, I'm weak but he is strong and why I'm telling you all this is that I was a pastor for some years and I had several churches. I was, first of all, I was a youth pastor, then I was assistant pastor, and I was one of a group in different churches, and eventually I had my own church. And when God called me, called me away from the pastor to the prophetic ministry, and it was a very hard thing for me emotionally because he'd asked me to raise up prophets, and he didn't ask, I didn't even, who knew what prophets were in the 70s? We didn't even know what it was. We didn't have any in Africa, and I didn't know, and I didn't need to, first of all, I've, I'm from a Jewish family, I've got this Jewish wit that always gets me in trouble. Um, I'm much more toned down than I used to be. I've but made older, I've become wiser, but I always couldn't help making jokes. Everything was, I saw everything in a comical light. It just was my nature. And it got me in so much, it got me in so much trouble as a young minister uh, in a conference. I had some spiritual people pull me aside and felt that I had a spirit of frivolousness. So they wanted to cast the spirit out of me to free me from it. And being a young preacher, I said, okay, go ahead. And they prayed and prayed and prayed and cast and yelled and everything else. And, and I, I thought the only way to get rid of them is to cough. <laughs> and they were happy when that happened. And so <laughs> they left me and it came back seven times stronger. <laughs> 
So I still am comical, but I keep it under good control now. And I still have my Jewish wit, and I'm not the only one. It's, a, it's the dry sense of humor that just can't help it. But I do see everything in a happy... I'm a very content person because I know in whom I believe. My contentment, Paul said, I, I, I've found the secret... The secret, it's not somebody everybody knows, somebody had to find. He didn't just have it, found the secret to contentment. It's a, I learned to abase and abound. None of these things that in my life, whether I'm doing well or not doing well, they don't affect my contentment. The secret is that my contentment is in him, and that it, is, it is very real. You may have been disappointed by your marriage, by your children, by your job, by things in life, by your friends, by all kinds of things in life. But I tell you, when you are in him and you walk with him, nothing can touch it. No, nothing. You've got nothing that I could possibly want because I really have it all in him. And if you're not enjoying that, you're missing out in life. There's nothing sweeter than having a, enjoying the love and the presence and the kindness of the Lord. He is such a friend and a father and a lover. He's everything you could possibly dream. You've got to give him a chance to show himself. You get hungry after him, he'll respond to you. He wants you to want him enough. That's what it really is, is now. So in the prophetic journey, I tried to tell God he had the wrong person. And when he spoke to me, he told me to raise up prophets. And I said, I can't even teach someone something I don't know anything about. And he said, I want you to live by faith. You need to move out of the same the church. I was one of the pastors of a church. And he said, you need to move out of this particular church and, and start this prophetic ministry. I said, that's so odd. I said, you know, God, if I was single, that I would do this, but the, the risk factor is so high for my poor wife and two children at the time. I have three, but there now, but there was two then. And I said, so I told God that was my real excuse. I had responsibility. Some months went by, in fact, three altogether, and I forgot all about this meeting. And, and I was on the way to church with my wife. This will be here in a few minutes. And then and my middle child was in the baby, two years old. And we crossed a railway track on the way to church. And on the way there... Uh, the, we stopped it, we always do, and pulled away, and the, the vehicle died on the track. I tried to turn that engine, I tried to put it in neutral, I tried to push it, I tried everything I knew to do. I could not get that vehicle off the track. And the train came. And I tried to stop the train, I tried everything, I, did, I was in panic mode. And this uh, train hit the vehicle, actually pushed the vehicle right off the track, and then stopped. The whole train stopped and blocked the traffic now, and uh, my, we got away just in time from the vehicle, and this voice said to me, so, you're very responsible. You almost killed your family. <laughs> Give them to me. I'll do better than, than that and to go where I sent you. And from that very moment, from that day, to this, I haven't stopped traveling the world prophetically. I'm not driven by fear. I'm driven by immense love for him that keeps growing and everything drives me. That's why I do the amount of meetings I do and the people's lives I touch constantly. I'm I've constantly, every day, all day, like this morning, early, I have the Austrians uh, asking for help. Uh, uh, minister there's asking in a critical situation. Always ask, and that's what I do. Is I'm, I'm glad to do it because I love the Lord. I'm driven by my love for him. It's a joy. It's not a work. It's not labor. It's an absolute joy. And why I'm telling you all this is for 40 odd years now, I have uh, gone this journey of prophetic and I, my love must be so strong for him that I was able to overcome the constant difficulties with the prophetic the five-fold ministry everybody celebrates the pastor the teacher the evangelist and the apostle the apostle is mentioned 72 times in the new testament the pastor only once and the prophet is mentioned 250 times and the understanding of the prophet is very different to even today. We, the immediate thing we go to is that a prophet is someone that prophesies all the time. Well, it's so obscure to me because we're told to covet the gift of prophecy above all the other gifts that are there, which are, and there are nine gifts, which are tongues and interpretation, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning of spirits, prophecy, and the gift of healings and the working of miracles, and the gift of faith. These are nine gifts, and the gift of prophecy. Of all these nine gifts, even the gift of faith and gift of miracles, we're supposed to desire prophecy more. Above all these things. Why? Well, the truth is, if you get a miracle, if, something, if you're sick and desperately dying, and you come forward and someone lays hands on you, and the miracle happens, and everybody, even the doctor, surprised how that things are turned around, and your life goes on, you're healed, and it's constant testimony of how God did a miracle for you, everybody celebrates. But whether it's 20 or 30 years, you enjoy your miracle, then you die, and your miracle's gone. All those gifts are just here for those few years. But Jesus said... Heaven and earth will pass away, 
but my word, but my word, but my word. When you speak God's word, it's the single thing that goes into eternity. That nothing will stop. It's greater than anything else because it's by his word that the earth was made. It's by his word that mountains fall. He speaks. He's even, and we are made in his image. That's why he said to Ezekiel, can these bones live? Uh -huh. You've got to speak to them. Uh, let me get this straight. You want me to talk to the bones? Is there anything you want me to particularly say to those bones? Yes, tell them to live. You want me to tell those bones to live. All right. Can you imagine that? And we're told in the New Testament to speak to the mountain. I mean, how weird is that? You speak to a mountain. Mountain, move! I mean, it sounds so odd, but that's, we have power in our words. We only have one mouth, two ears, two, <laughs> two eyes, two nostrils, two everything, but only one mouth, because the one mouth we have is already dangerous enough, gives us enough trouble already, so we've got to get that thing under control. Words are extremely powerful. They are tools and weapons. Many people, to my mother told me that sticks and stones will break my bones, that words will never, words are the things that put people in, in hospitals and wards of psychological that mess up their lives, all their lives because words or lack of the right words. Words are powerful tools and you as God's children are instruments of words all the time. I've learned in my prophetic journey that because I used to prophesy such detail like people's names and, and I used to put my faith behind those things and God stopped me. He said, why are you doing that? All the tension's coming to you. You need to stop that. And he, from, the very, from that very deep revelation of someone's name or some information, I went from there to God loves you. That's what he asked me to say next. And that was so hard for me because I, God loves you. It's no revelation. But when it's God's word, yeah. I don't need to be noticed. It will penetrate. God's word doesn't come back void. And I've noticed that God reassures his people constantly. What I would have thought that would have been known or accepted isn't always. People need the, the constant affirmation of their Father in heaven. And we are instruments to confirm and, and do those things and speak life to people. All that's good, pure, and holy, think on these things. God's called us to be positive. There's enough negative and whiny complaining. We don't come to church to be told how bad we are or to have whiny complaining. We come here to build up and connect with the almighty God. So in my journey, I had to function and raise up prophets and teach prophecy. And it took many years for me to be accepted in Africa. When I, in my nation, I was very, was it, what time is I finished? Uh, uh, <clears throat> just wave it before I do something for go too long, right? You, oh, you got me. Thank you. What's your name? Amanda. You and me, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So... <laughs> So in my, in my journey, I had to learn about prophecy. No one taught me. I had to find the Word of God. And being Jewish, we tear everything apart in the Word. It's very common for us in our Jewish faith. We only have 24 books in our Bible. So we always have some rabbi, and they differ, and they argue about some of the, what the meaning of the Scripture is. You know, uh, you guys read your Bibles, and it says, Jesus told them, you forsake the law for your tradition. And I, and I know that my, my Gentile friends don't always understand what that means. And I've gotten to this age where I realize I need to start sharing some of my Jewish traditions so you understand what the, we're reading. Because when Jesus said that, I knew exactly what he was saying. We have traditions handed down to us that become as vital as living. Uh, for example, today in Israel, if you go to Israel today, you will not have a single piece of uh, meat with dairy products. Never. They will always separate the two. You'll have dairy in the morning and you'll have meat in the evening. You'll never have the two together. And the reason is because one rabbi, one rabbi years ago found a scripture that said it is cruel to boil a calf in its mother's milk. One scripture and a whole tradition. And we have many traditions like that. And some of the most amazing rabbis have taught wonderful things. But they became so real to the nation that they would make it like a Bible. And in fact, it's called a Mishnah. It's in book form. And we, they embrace it so, we embrace it so much more than the actual law. And he said, why do you break our traditions of washing the hands? Because it's a tradition. It's important. It's a spiritual act. And you have to, and, and I, they do, we do, just had Passover yesterday. Passover is a huge thing. In Israel, it's for a Jew, it's huge. And it gets a little bit extreme, in fact. And that's because of the traditions and things and we ingrained. And, and they would rather stone Jesus, even though he had the miraculous, watched him do miracles, because they didn't like what he said. 
they would cling to their traditions or what they believed was far more important than the miracles itself. Now, the book of Isaiah has 22 prophecies in Isaiah that clearly talks about Jesus. It talks about a virgin birth. It talks about that the blind eyes will open. Deaf ears will hear, and Jesus quotes that scripture in Matthew when he talks about, sends word to John, because, but the Jews were blinded to these scriptures in Isaiah. If you take a Jew today and you start opening up Isaiah to them, which they love, Jews love Isaiah, then it will shock them. At times I've done it, they're always like, why don't they teach us to ensure? Why don't they teach us these things at, 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 at synagogue? Why don't we hear this? Because they don't want you to know that, that he's, the, he's already the Messiah. He's already come, the Messiah. Boy, you're an excited bunch. You take it down. You make me overwhelming with your, with your excitement. Okay, so. <laughs> you know, Jesus, uh, I'll talk about that later. I'm not, I don't teach the same thing. You need to come to the next session. I'm going to talk about something that's very interesting uh, about the Jews and about uh, Jesus told the woman at the well, he said, uh, you worship what you don't know. And I want to talk about that to you in, to, in the next session, if you'll listen to the, me, if you'll come again. Okay, so getting back to the prophet. So God gave me this, this, this mandate to raise up prophets, and I had to do it with all my strength. And I keep looking at the word and studying what it is. And I'm at this stage in my life, and I, we have encounters, and I'm training up prophets all the time. We've launched a prophetic school called Prophets Academy. It's online now. We, we haven't officially launched it in America, but we've launched it in Africa, and it's still, it's still available to you. And uh, it's a, it is a family of prophetic people. We don't want to ever be in competition to the church. We have to help enhance your life in church, but bring out the best in you prophetically that we can. And <clears throat> in the school now, I'm working very hard to define clearly what a New Testament prophet is. And the longer and the harder I look, the more shocked I am at what it's not. The concept that a prophet is one that always prophesies is incorrect because we're told several times in the word, and I hope you believe the Bible, that in first, for example, there's two people that give us information. There's Luke in, his, in the book of Acts and, of course, Paul in, the, in, in his letter to Corinthians. Now, just but you know, Paul wasn't one that was under the life of Jesus. He was, a, he was in the same time. He was there. Oddly enough, Paul came from Tarsus and was in the Jerusalem in the same time as Christ was just, he was still very young, was merging in his ministry. Paul was studying under a very famous rabbi. There's always some highly respected, actually not a rabbi, he was actually a teacher of the law. He was a very highly skilled teacher, and his name was Galmiel. And he's the same guy that Barnabas studied under too. They both studied under the same person who was highly respected. He's the man in Acts 5 that when the, when the Sanhedrin says, you better stop preaching in Jerusalem, and they say, it's better we obey God than man, they, Galmiel says, brethren, just send these people out. Let me talk to you. And he says to them, he's such a wise man. He says, you remember, if, if this is from God, if they're from God and they're preaching, you're fighting God. But if it's not from God, it's going to die anyway. Such a wise old man. That's the man that Paul studied under. And he brags. He says, of all the Jews, this alone, he says, of all the Jews of my age, I was the most finely tuned and experienced in the Jewish law. So he was very zealous. That's why he was a candidate for God to pick him. Because he was so dedicated to God that with his whole life, but he was on the wrong track. So God shows himself, Lord Jesus shows himself on the road to Damascus, and he has an immediate switch. <coughs> now there's an interesting situation too, I hope I'm not boring you now. Uh, when he, he's in Damascus, and there's a, the Bible says that the disciple, this phraseology is used in the scripture, in Acts, he's not, a, he's not an apostle, he's not a prophet, he's not even a pastor or teacher, he's a disciple, this name Ananias. And he has a converse with God, a communication. It's, what does it mean, disciple? What he's learning? We, he's still learning. He's following. He's growing. He's just a regular Christian, it seems to me. And he gets, and God picked that guy to be a key person to go to Saul of Tarsus. Uh, and, uh, and it's how interesting is that because sometimes, and he argues with God like any good Christian would. <laughs> but Lord, I've heard so much about this man. Obviously, you haven't, so I'm going to have to, we have to share with you. And he's come with authority. And I know you're authority, God, but this is real authority from the chief priests. To, and so he's arguing with God. And eventually God tells him to go. And he does the most amazing thing in my heart that I find amazing. He walks into Saul. He's just been nervous of Saul being there to kill him. And he walks into Saul and he says, brother Saul. We can't even get people in the church today to recognize each other as family. If they have some doctrinal difference, he walks in by faith and says, Brother Saul, the, the Lord who you met on the road to Damascus, 
has sent me here that you may receive your sight. That's what he tells him. And of course, he, the whole thing begins to unfold. And Saul is very excited about the Lord, and he begins to teach. And of course, he's so learned in the Word. What we get our doctrines from is all from uh, Jews wrote the whole Bible. So we connect it to the Jews. You must come the next session, you'll hear that you are actually a Jew. According to Scripture, the word Jew means chosen. So you're not, they're not any more Jewish than you are. Now, Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda cut people's heads off. They kill the infidels. But you never see them ever put on the, the little screen. They have to show it off. They never show you executing someone from Hare Krishna or Buddhists. They're apparently not infidels. They're probably something good, I think. But it's the Christians and the Jews that are the biggest enemies. Together, we are joint family. Amen. You are a Jew, whether you want to be or not. Those in Israel are your family. Yes. Amen. And when they killed, or was destroying the spirit of Hamas, that's what brought our towers down. That's why they attacked us too. Yes. You realize that in the 80s, we had a thing called the 1040 window. And, how many, oh, and that 1040 window is now a 1020 window. And since it became a 1020 window, all the revivals that took place in, amongst the interning Muslims, I remember Reinhardt telling me personally that the happiest day in his life was when he had two and a half million people saved in a meeting. And I asked him, I said, Reinhardt, how do you even know you got two and a half million people saved? He said, they're all filled in salvation cards. Two and a half million salvation cards. Wow. Do how do you, it's, such, yeah. it's enormous. He said, brother, I had three and a half million in the, me in the meeting, as far as your eye could see. I said, oh, well, it's wonderful. And he explained it to me how it all worked, but they were Muslims because they saw the miraculous. And so that 1040 window became 1020, and it was the retaliation of that spirit that hit America. Because we fund, America is the greatest support for mission work and ministry all around the world. There's no country that support, that sends and supplies and blesses like America. You must understand, we take a lot of things for granted, but we're prosperous in this nation, very prosperous. You individually are more prosperous than you realize. Even with all the struggles, you, 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 <laughs> Gentiles are very foolish with money. I, I've always tried to figure out what's, what's wrong with these goy. Why do they make such... I hear them advertising to re... Excuse me, get off the track again, but you, the, I hear them advertising for you to refinance your home. To me, an, only an idiot does that. Because you, a house, if you buy a house for $100,000, by the time you paid the compounded interest, it's $300,000. It's normal, but, and you expect that. But now the first part, because it's, it's compounded, the first part of your payments are all interest. Until you start getting the interest, the bit of the balance down, then it starts getting, it starts tipping. So you start paying the house off towards the end. Now you still owe the loss on the house, and you refinance the house. So we're doing that again. We're ballooning it again with all the interest. Like, you must be my sugar or something. Hit your head on the rock to go and do it again. Well, my payments are lower. Yeah, and longer. And you're going to be making them all rich. Don't do that. And then, of course, we, the credit cards come in. No country gets credit cards in the mail like America. And then, and then you, 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 oh, I'm going to just, I need it now, so I'll just, I'll just call this number and activate the card. I'll, I'll pay it by the end of the month. And 10 years later, you still have the same card at 26% interest. And you can't, couldn't pay it this month, so you, had, so you just paid the minimum, and, you, and it just up went the end. And then you can't tithe, which is you're financing the credit cards. To me, that's foolishness. It's unwise. And we will make more debt. We get an increase in, the, in salary. How can we go buy and make more debt? Well, instead of using it to make, when you, when you buy anything, a car or a house, make war on your debt. And what that means in your heart, you're going to do all you can to get rid of that. Amen. If you watch these, these people right here, there must be the Jewish influence in their lives. They worked hard to get their house paid. They, they worked hard as they can to get, even if they got less and small, they're going to make sure they don't have house payments. That's... That's what Jews think. We don't, we don't think, of how can make more debt? Do you understand? Because once, if, you, if you, you buy a car, if you paid your car off, and you have loose, it's amazing how powerful you become when you've got a little money in the bank. You should have savings. And, now, God prospers you, and God will prosper you if you start being a little wise steward and, and obedient in, his, in the giving. America has prospered because we've always been givers. There's no nation in the world that gives. In fact, if there's any calamity, if we have like Katrina, you don't see anybody helping us, but we help everybody else. They don't like us, but they take our money. Yeah. Yeah. So true. And because America blesses, and God is true. No, God's not mocked. You'll not mock him. What a man sows, that's why God's blessed this nation. Do you understand? Yes. So we're very prosperous. Now, I don't know how I got into that track now. I was <laughs> teaching about prophets. Defining prophecy. Off the, why don't you keep me on track now? How much time do I have? How much time do I have? 
20 minutes. Okay, give me three moments. I, I didn't get to all the things I want to get to, but so the defining a prophet is not someone that just prophesies. It is someone that teaches. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 29, Paul, that was talking about Paul, and his teaching, he says, let two or three prophets speak. And someone sitting down should carefully weigh what is being said. Then the next verse says, and if someone prophesies, then get a prophetic word, then the first speaker should give them an opportunity to speak. So he's teaching that these prophets are speaking. Then we read again in Acts 15, verse 32, it says that Silas, which was the companion to Paul, and Judas, they were, they were two working together, delivering a letter to the Gentiles, what they decided in Jerusalem, with themselves being prophets, said much to strengthen the brethren. Well... <laughs> What, what does it mean that they prophesy? They both, both are speaking. They're not, the word speak in Corinthians is speak. It's no way you can look at it any way prophesying. So it mean, seems to me that the prophets are people that minister, that are spiritual people. The Jewish concept of a prophet is different to a priest or a teacher of the law all, and a rabbi. All different functions. And the understanding of a prophet is someone that will speak on behalf of God. It doesn't have to always be a prophecy, but someone that is sensitive. In 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, if I speak, if I, uh, if I speak in tongues and have, have not love, I'm a sounding gong and a clanging cymbal. Remember that scripture? The next verse says, and if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries. There's a revelation that comes or a depth that comes with revelation and prophecy and prophets that is different. And when you let them speak, they're sharing something that's on a little higher level. And there are more prophets than there are apostles or pastors or even teachers of the word. And we need to have them rise up. We need to have them. And they were recognized because until the new, this Holy Ghost came, there were even females called prophetesses. Well, we don't have apostles, and we don't have pastoresses, so we, there are prophets today, but it's since the Holy Ghost came. In fact, a lot of practice in the Israeli life was very different until the Holy Ghost came. Even the disciples themselves were casting lots to decide who'd be the next apostle after Judas. They cast lots, which is like throwing dice. Imagine if I would throw dice and say, all right, pastors, if you're going to be next to your pastor, let's see if you get two sixes, otherwise you're out. <laughs> It sounds ridiculous, but that's what they did until the Holy Ghost came. Then the Holy Ghost, now there again, in the church in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. They were prophet teachers, and, the, and there was five of them named. Well, where are the apostles? Why didn't you mention them? Well, why were, why are you, because the prophets were recognized as spiritual people, people that were connected. And there's more people connected in here, and we're afraid to use the word prophet because of the expectancy that you always hear God accurately and make no mistakes, and, and you're not human. But uh, there's a whole different concept of what an intestine prophet should be like, a, f a function, how they understood it. And we hope to see more of that. And I want to prophesy before the time runs out, because I know you all want that more than even teaching. <laughs> Come to our encounters. I'll teach more on this. I've never got to all I want to get. The next session is completely different. Don't even hesitate to come. What's your name with the gold thing? <laughs> you blinky. You bling bling. Sharon, right? All right. Sherry, Sherry like come, come out tonight, that one. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that song. You're healthy. Yeah. Are you married? Where is he today? Do you like him? <laughs> you laugh and it's funny to you if I ask you if you like him? Most of the time, right? Yeah. So what is your name, sir? A uh, Bob. A uh, Bob? Yeah. So I can't call you just, just Bob. I must have called you a uh, Bob. I must call you just Bob. It's so confusing. <laughs> and you guys are legally married, right? How long? 12 years, then okay, you must like him. Come on now. It's an adjustment, right? <laughs> your mind goes all over the place. I see you've got a, your, your God's teaching you to stay, stay, Bob, stay, stay. I'm coming to you. Don't be happy as I'm prophesying to her. <laughs> your mind goes all over the place and you've got a heart, you, just like your top, you've got a heart of gold. There's no evil, wickedness, selfishness, nothing in you. But life's been a tough journey for you because you're trying so hard. You're trying. So the first thing the Lord says to you, stop trying. Just be yourself because you are so acceptable and so wonderful as you are. The difficulty with you is you want everyone to like you. Good luck with that one. Because even God can't do that. A lot of people just don't like God. 
and he's done nothing but right. So shake that off because the right people love you. You're still trying to please someone in your family to this day. They're gone and you're still trying to please them. You need to shake it off because you please the Lord. God loves your heart. Do you understand? You say things so trying to do right and people take it wrongly. All that stuff just, just bothers you. Shake it off. Be yourself. Just be who you are. And you've got no wickedness in you. So if they don't like you, you'll do your best, but you don't take it on yourself personally anymore. Do you understand? Because you are a gift. You are a sweetheart. There's no other way to describe you. Yeah. God wants you to be happy. You're trying too hard to be happy. Just be. Just be happy. Enjoy. Yeah. You're a blessing. Bob, you're an interesting old man. You really are. <laughs> You're very, you're very uh, predictable and very faithful. Yeah. Uh, very boring sometimes because we know exactly what you're going to eat and when you're going to leave and what you're going to do, what you're going to wear. You don't move from your normal uh, lifestyle, but you're very faithful. Yeah. And um, it takes you time to grasp things. Uh, men don't have the same grasp as women that are sensitive. And, uh, but when you do grasp it, you've got it. And you have a great understanding. Your motivation is totally amazing. You're a good, good man. There's no other way to describe you. But you're a guy, as I am, and we do things that are kind of clumsy. But God's been teaching you as years go on, and you're very valuable to the Lord. His value system is different to that of man's. Uh, you can't go by people's opinions or their comments. God celebrates you for your integrity, for your faithfulness. He celebrates you that you follow through, that you keep your word. All those things have been very moving to God. And God is on your side. I don't know what you do for a living, but God's always going to cause money to flow in your life till the day you breathe your last. Somehow, there'll always be a, some river of some kind where there's money coming into your life. And because you've sown enough seeds in your life and you're very careful, you can be sometimes very thrifty and almost ridiculous about trying to cut, cut costs here and then you spend money on other crazy stuff. It's the strangest, it's just an unusual fella. But you also very, she's, she's enjoying it now, it's her turn. <laughs> <laughs> but you're an upright man and a good man. You, there's nothing, there's not a lick of evil in you and God honors you today. In fact, God smiles on you so much that he, the, the, you're, you're used by date has been moved up. God, God has I'm, said, I'm extending that use by date. It's because I see the usefulness and the fruitfulness in your life is so much more. There's a restoration, reconciliation. I don't know how many kids you have, or where they are, but there's a reconciliation of relationships and family that have been strained. And it wasn't your doing. You could have helped it better, but no one can do it all perfectly anyway. But that how God's going to heal and restore that very soon. Next year is going to be a, one of the most memorable years of your life, just a memorable, because of so many of those things, how God just intervenes. But God is with you, and he thanks you for being faithful to his kingdom and his house. All right. What's your name with the tattoos? Zach attack. Did I speak to you yet? No. We had a Zach yesterday, uh, Friday, did we? Another Zach. Okay. Zach, are you married in love? What? Not married? Do you have, do you have a girlfriend? Do you want me to look for you? <laughs> trying to help. What do you do, Zach? Uh, like yeah. You paint cars. Most unusual, to say the least. And you, uh, do you come to this church? Yeah, I do. Do you like it here? I'm, I'm glad you came because the Lord rescued you. He literally went in and rescued you from a wrong journey you were on. Had you stayed on that journey, had you not turned from it, it would have been destructive for you. You were running from not being good enough always. They just, and it, no one knows in this room some of the abuses you had to put up with even as a young kid. It was really strange. And it wasn't your fault. You did nothing to deserve it. You were just a victim. But, but. God makes, not allows, God makes deliberately and aggressively things work together for good. So everything the devil meant to hurt you with is going to become a blessing in your life. That's God's plan. You've got a lot of love in your heart and you've got everything well controlled and you're very seasoned. You've got your own life very careful. But you're actually far more talented than you even know yourself. You have skills inside of you and one of the greatest talents and skills you have is the sense of order you have. Some things have to be a certain way just bothers you. You'll walk in the woods and something's amiss, you'll notice it because it's out of order. Anything that's out of order, that doesn't seem normal to you. Your, your eye catches it right away because you have a strong sense of order. You're very loyal. You're, you're not a man that wants to date a bunch of girls. It's just not your nature. You're very loyal by nature. Very one betrothed to one person's who you are. But life is 
thrown so many strange curveballs at you, and you don't get it all. And so you've got all those emotions suppressed and controlled. And being a child of God, you're growing to learn to become dependent and completely, completely in his arms that he'll take care of you. Because it was, it was a happy day when you were born. God has great plans. You have a wonderful gift for young people and children that God has blessed you with, that kids relate to you because you're so integrous and so dependable about so many things. And the devil tried to kill you. There was a time that if God had not intervened, you wouldn't be here today. And it was that important to God to stop that because your destiny is enormous. So just keep going. Don't miss church. Let feed, feed in the things of God. Shake off the family and embrace this one and watch what God will do for you. What's your name so next to him? Robbie. And how old are you? And what do you do? You sell cars. God's trying to get some direction in your life. It's like you've been here, there, everywhere. You've got a good heart, but you didn't get any direction. As to which, we didn't know which way you wanted to go. It's a little confusing. But you're very smart. You have a great skill with learning things, and uh, you didn't finish things you start. He's a real finisher, and you're not the finisher. You just, uh, you've got a lot of ideas and vision, and everybody's buddy, but you don't finish stuff. And you make promises you can't keep because you forgot about it. And, but your heart's, there's no wickedness, and you just, it wasn't important to you. And uh, you've, you also have tried to please someone. One person was always dissatisfied with you. You didn't, you didn't match their expectancy. And there was a lot of brokenness in your family, things that happened over the years. And God wants to heal some things inside of you. But you have so much skill to lead and to touch people's lives. There's so much love inside of you that needs to come on out. And you're just a very much a people person that God has blessed you with. And so it was a very, also a very happy day when you were born. There was celebration because you are going to touch a lot of lives and God's got some good things planned for you. He's going to bring some order. Well, the order he has, he's going to bring some order to your life. Because sometimes you can be a bit of a slob. Stuff's all over the place and you can be more organized. And get the paperwork done correctly. <laughs> Yeah, finish the stuff. Yes, sir. But you've but you got enormous potential. Enormous. What's your name? Sam. Sam. And how old are you, Sam? All 23. How old are you? 26. You're the older one, okay? Uh, 23. And so what do you do, Sam? Assembly. What? Assemble what? Okay. And where's mom and dad? Okay, because you've, I see a lot of wholesomeness around you that you've been had a lot of purity and things. That you, to him, it's given much as much expected. You've been given so much privileges because of your upbringing and, and, the, and the surroundings you had. You didn't have to deal with other stuff like other kids did. But you have so much more to give them because of you have an advantage. And you need, to, you need to finish the school that you thought you need to go to and finish that whole route that's God's plan. You've got to finish school. It's very important. Even if you never use what you study, but the whole exercise of completing that gives you, will give you the confidence you need. But you're very smart. You're very methodical. You need time, though. You need to sleep on a thing to make up a good decision. You just don't like impulsive. You hate pressure. You hate it. You want to have time to think things through, and that's how God made you. It is God's plan, eventually, to put you into the ministry. That's God's plan, ultimately. But not today, not now, not next month, not next year. It's a long-term plan. But that's what you're built for, is to help people and to direct them because you, you have all the, the, the makings of a good spiritual leader. Do you understand that? All right, dude. Yeah, I put, I assemble things. Thank you. <laughs> What's that? I put them down. Have you, have you got any, what do you like to minister to? Anybody that comes to mind? Someone you'd like me to minister to that I look for people that don't often get words that I'd like to share with Linda over here Linda over here behind Dan what behind Dan so you Linda over here is that your last name over here <laughs> what do you do Miss Linda what do you do a missionary and a good one too you're a spiritual leader you have paid and you have scars you've paid the price to be the spiritual leader you are and the faith that you have. You don't care what people think and say. You care what God says now. And there's some books inside of you that need to come on out because you have enormous depth, enormous. Real woman of God, you do hear the Lord clearly. Some people think you're a little crazy. 
because you hear God so well and, and you hear the Spirit, but you were, you're a prophet before your time. There's so many things that you're ahead of. And so there were times when you were so lonely. That's what happens in the ministry. If you really walk with God, it's a lonely journey. People don't do, do, always share what you have. But there are others that are like you, that God will cause you to link up with. You've paid a great price to be where you are today. Come a long way. You have to let go of so much in your life. And uh, people resent you in your own family because of your decisions that you've made to, for the Lord. And that's nothing uncommon. Jesus said, you're not willing to forsake all for my sake. That's what he said. And you've understood those relationships. The biggest thing in your life, the biggest thing is your relationship with God. In the years that you've walked with the Lord, there's such an intimacy, such an intimacy. And you need to awaken that thing again and write it down some of the things that you've learned about walking with the Lord. Very important. You know about healing. You've, you've experienced God heal you physically. You've, you've walked through things. You understand those things. In your mission journey, there's a lot of changes coming. I uh, see a lot of discipleship in your life. That's the next phase of your life. You're going to have spiritual sons and daughters all over the place, just training them and, and, and growing them. It's who you are. You'll be dedicated them like your own children. They'll be own, that's how dedicated it's going to be for you. God's going to do that. He's shutting a lot of doors at the moment because he's opening other ones. Yeah? He has to shut them. So you go, the way he made the, the, the raven and the river brook stop flowing to make Elisha go to the widow's house. He's closed doors for you, so you will make you to go to the place God's planned you to go. He's not going to use you in the mission field the way you were. He's going to use you in churches to inspire the mission field and the intimacy with God. That's what God's got planned for you. Yes, ma'am. That's what I'm saying. Anybody else you got there? Went to, five minutes went by fast. Are you timing me correctly? I'm watching you, Amanda. Go ahead, ma'am. This family. All right. So well, let's start with the fellow with the, with the haircut. <laughs> What's your name, sir? Ryan. Ryan. And this is your lovely... Did you, did you know that, ma'am? I do. And, and, and where are you from? I'm from Guyana. Guyana, South America. And where are you from, sir? All over, honestly. Where were you born? German. Deutschland. Do you speak German? Nine. Oh. <laughs> See, nine. <laughs> I'll be in Germany in a few weeks' time. So tell me, what, what, uh, what do you do for a living? Uh, military. Military. What do you do in the military? Uh, right now, I'm a girl, but military police. Police. Something very dramatic is changing in your career. Uh, the God is moving you to a different level, different something very new and different. Uh, and it's like you've had such a lot of difficulties. Oh, these are all symptoms like pregnancy and giving birth. It's birth pains for the next new phase that God has for you. You've got to watch getting resentful and angry because it's God using situations that are changing. Don't let that stuff get on your spirit, man, because God's making changes. Trust him with your life. You don't trust anybody. You're always suspicious and careful, but someone's going to do some bad stuff. You've got to shake that off because there are a lot of people that are upright and good and wholesome. You're not evil. You don't always have a scheme in the background, so why would someone else have it always? Not everyone does that. You've been let down and burned so many times, but that's just a few people, not everybody. And so God has good plans for you, and you're called to be a teacher of the Word. You're not doing it, but you're supposed to teach the Word. You have a wonderful gift to teach, but you're keeping a distance because you don't want to be disappointed. You've got to take a chance. Take a chance. All right. As for you, my sister, you're a delight. You love the things of the Spirit. You hear God. You are so devoted to the Lord. You are the life, life source for Him. He's so different to you, and your love and patience has brought a lot of healing to Him. He's a, he has enormous greatness in him that needs to come on out. And you the helper to bring it out because he was stamped and pushed down by all kinds of plans of the enemy in years gone by. And you the, you the daughter, lovely as you are, got more here than dad, huh? <laughs> She's saying, thank God, thank God. <laughs> so what is your name? <coughs> Carla? Cara. Cara. Cara, okay. And how many children do you guys have? For now. Okay, just one. How old are you, Cara? Third, you're a teenager. Wow, that's nice. And what do you want to do with your life? You're a doctor, ma'am? 
okay, because I do see medical field in you, but it's not like your mother. You're going to do something that's much more specialized and technical and just unusual because you're very smart. You're also math very mathematical and very, you remember things. You're very smart in working out problems. And the uh, mom is very caring to people and she studied, but you have the gift that will help people on a different kind of level, but also in the medical industry. There's no question. So you're going to go to school. You're a very good student. You're very acad good academically. And so you'll flourish with all of that. Uh, you have certainly have um, your dad's brains because mom still has hers. He needs, she needs it. <laughs> you like my joke, don't you, sir? <laughs> yeah. Nine. Nine. Yeah, nine. Yeah. You're a lovely, lovely family. My sister, I appreciate your heart uh, more than just being a doctor. You're just a, a wonderful lady, woman of God, and you care about people. And people use you. What I, I enjoy the most about you is how they abuse and use you, but you doesn't change your heart towards them. You forgive instantly. It's remarkable. And you have such favor. God smiles on you because of that. And you were almost not here today as a baby. They all thought they could take you out as a baby. And God watched over you and healed and brought you back. It could not, they could not stop you. Here you are today. And he needs you. He does. He doesn't know how to tell you how much he appreciates you. But he does. He does. He loves you. Smile at least, sir. <laughs> Sheesh. Sheesh. All right, we have one minute. We've got one more. Okay, ma'am. What's your name? What's your name, young lady? Chantel. Hi, Chantel. Are you visiting here today? Do you like it? So far, so good. But now with the prophecy, I'm not sure what we're going to do with that. Are you born again? But you're so ready for it. You know what that is, though? Being born again, do you understand what it is? To become a Christian doesn't mean to go to church or join a church or join a club. Born again is a relationship with the Lord Jesus. He died for us on the cross because we, every one of us in this room are sinners. Everyone, whether you sin once or thousands, it's sin. And we're going to hell, all of us. But Jesus died so we wouldn't have to. And the reason he did that because he loves us, gave his life, he became sin for us. And all we have to do is accept it, take him into our life and let him become our Lord and Savior. That's it. And you are so, I feel you're so ripe and ready for it. That you're not still piecing it out in your head. You're just looking for truth in your life. And you're a little tired, I see. A little tired in your soul of life. It's worn you down with stuff. You're just tired of trying to balance everything. But you were born to be a woman of God. You were born to walk with the Lord. It's something inside of you. You've always had this awareness of God. Always. And you've tried to make everyone's life better, try to find meaning, try to find reasoning, logical, because the motive, the, the heart that you have inside is so good. It's so kind and, and unselfish. And you don't even have the baptism of God inside of you yet. And you're already like this. So I can't imagine what you'll be like when God fills your life completely, because it's inside of you. Now, you don't know this, but you have an anointing to sing. Inside of you, there's a, there's a voice that God has given you. It's not the purity of voice, but the song that's inside of your soul that comes from deep inside of you that's going to touch people's lives. So I do see you singing, with a, however it's going to be, and just touching people's lives. You sing little songs now by your little self, and you haven't had the Holy Ghost touch you yet, but you will. You're going to shake off and shed like a skin, like an old jacket, all the stuff from past. You've tried, you've done, you've tried to do everything right. You've tried to piece logically through. You're a practical, logical person, but now you're going to let the heart of God lead you rather than the head because the head doesn't work as much as well as the heart. A lot of changes coming in your works arena. You're not going to stay where you are. There's a lot of moves coming. It's all part of the plan, and God's got a bigger door open for you than before, but he wants to first get you into the kingdom. So I hope this morning you'll let someone pray with you just to help you get Accept the Lord as your Savior would be the most marvelous thing for you to do. I would normally do it, but I, want, I feel that I have to take a little time with someone in my heart, if you don't mind this morning, okay? Can we do that? All right, thank you. I'm, I'm going to take a break now, and we're back at 11, and I will not teach the same thing, so please try and come. I didn't even finish my first teaching. Mm -hmm.